All right, I'm Patrick Armstrong. I'm here with Dr. Joseph Mazza. Dr. Mazza, so um, when and where were you born? I was born in a little town in North East Pennsylvania, a little town adjacent to the city of Wilkesbury, Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. Now, if you can keep in mind that Wilkesbury and Scranton are up in the northeast corner of the state, and that was the epitome of anthracite coal. That whole area, when I was growing up and generations before that, maybe two generations before that, coal was the big industry. In fact, coal was the only industry. That was the only place in the continental United States where anthracite coal was being mined. And anthracite coal is something special. It's the closest thing to a diamond. It's not like bituminous coal or soft coal or clinker coal that comes from the Midwest and even up in places like Wyoming. Anthracite coal is, is mined very deep and it is pure carbon. And it's very brittle because it is pure carbon. And so the mines, the whole city of Wilkesbury, which sat on the Susquehanna River geographically, and the Susquehanna River, remember, goes, flows all the way down through southern Pennsylvania, uh, through Harrisburg, and on into the, into the Chesapeake Bay. Now, um, coal, when I was a kid, was king. The immigrants who came to that, this area were miners for the most part. They came from Czechoslovakia, from Poland, Sl uh, Slovenia. These were miners. And, and anthracite coal was, as I said, the major industry. And um, the United Mine Workers was one of the big deals with respect to the country going forth to unionizing. Working conditions in the mines were abominable. They were terrible. And so there was a crying need for, for restrictions and better conditions in the mines for the mine workers. And John L. Lewis, who was the head of the United Mine Workers, came to town very frequently. And I can remember going down into town with my big brother and, and friends to hear him talk in the early 1950s, late 40s. And uh, he was largely responsible for improving working conditions in the mines. And the unionizing of these mine workers. Well, it just so happened that um, in the late 50s, after several big storms, heavy rains, the mines flooded. Now, you got to understand the whole city on both sides of the river was honeycombed with mines. These are tunnels that were down 1,500 feet, 2,000 feet. And when some of the walls broke down, the river flooded into the mines. And some of the big rainstorms caused that to happen. And in addition, at about that time, when I was in high school, um, the mines had, become, had suffered terrible uh, situation with respect to um, people not, the miners not being able to get down and, and work and mine the anthracite coal. Anthracite coal, by the way, was, was an important heating um, unit for, for all the stoves in the houses, not so much the big industry and big buildings. It burned very clean and very clear. When you burn anthracite coal, there was nothing left. There were no impurities in it. So when you burn anthracite, the ashes you can blow off your hand. You, can't, you couldn't do that with bituminous coal and, and the clinker coal that I became acquainted with when I went out to Chicago to go to medical school. And so um, at that time, however, in the late 50s, when I was just graduating from high school in 1954, the unemployment lines were very long. And, and on top of that, to complicate the situation, oil soon became the fuel of choice for homes and for big businesses. So anthracite coal sort of became defunct. 
because it was difficult to mine it because the mines were flooded. And number two, uh, it took a great deal more um, input into getting the mines, the coal out of the mines at that time because of the complications that occurred. And number three, uh, oil was easily available and people opted for using oil in their houses. But I can remember when I was a kid, um, because the whole area was, was, as I said, it was a one industry community. Everything was predicated on anthracite coal. And there were, there were breakers and mines all over the valley, the, the valley being Wyoming Valley, where the Susquehanna River ran through. But, but I, I can remember when the, when, the mine, when the coal would come up out of the mines, it would go up into these breakers where it was shaken and broken to different size so it could be transported. And it was transported largely by a railroad and, of course, locally by, by trucks. And it, when it was, came out of the breaker and into the coal cars, which circulated right underneath the breaker, you know, just pull the lever and all the coal went into these coal cars, uh, this was coal for the major East Coast cities. It was all along the East Coast. Anthracite coal was the fuel at that time, the, the, the fuel of choice in the early 50s and, and, and after the, first, uh, the Second World War, which was 1945. So, so um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, oh yeah, I, and what we used to do with my big brother, uh, uh, as an aside, we would go along the railroad tracks where these coal cars would come out of the breaker because a lot of the coal would spill off along the side of the tracks. And my brother John and I used to go with two or three burlap bags and pick up all the coal. It was the right size. It was all washed. We'd bring it home on a wagon. We always had our little wagon with us. We three burlap bags full of coal, bring them home. And that was um, good fuel for the living room stove. Okay. So then um, I was in high school in the um, mid-50s. And from junior high school to senior high school, um, I played a lot of ball. Uh, baseball. I got hurt playing football in 10th grade and had to quit. And um, I got hurt wrestling and had to quit. So the only thing I was able to do was run track and field and, and play baseball. So in 1954, and I was, I, as a student, I was really big and good in science and everybody knew it. Um, and I was the president of the science club for three years running. And um, when graduation time came around in 1954, I got a scholarship to go to the local college, which was a Notre Dame school, um, uh, Fathers of the Holy Cross. And um, this was good because the family could not afford to send me to school. And the family could not afford for me to have any kind of um, um, residence at school, even in the dorms, even though they were close to town. So I spent the four years at King's College in Wilkes-Barre, PA, living at home. So I had to travel back and forth every day to go to school. However, there were a lot of local kids who were in the same situation that I was that also traveled every day back and forth. So there were a number of different carpools that if you were standing on a proper corner, you would get picked up every morning. Coming home was a crapshoot. You know, you usually took the bus home, but you weren't in any big hurry to get home. School was done, so you just stood over by the public square and picked up the public transportation, which took you back out to Ashley, the little town next to Wilkesbury. So um, I was in a, I was a chemistry major, and influenced by uh, chemical engineering. And as an aside, I was also in the pre med program, but as a chemistry major. So. And then I um, 
in my last in my second year of college I picked up a couple of additional physics credits and um, I had no idea what I was going to do but I was having a good time in college I lived at home there were no expenses uh, there was a great social life because a lot of the kids that I went to high school with and from many of the other high schools in the valley because the valley uh, Wyoming Valley had 350,000 people and and there were public schools not so many catholic schools um Ginny went to a catholic school but there were lots of public schools up and down the valley so and we got to know each other because of the social life there were dances in different places on the weekends there were places to hang out on the weekends so it was it was quite good in terms of the social life. Um, so then, when I started my third year, um, I I decided I was going to pick up more biosciences. So I picked out. Um, I had already had chemistry, and I had already had organic chemistry. So I picked up biochemistry, and um, and I picked up physiology. And then I picked up about three different theology courses. I mean, I, you know, uh, mother was uh, confused and so was I. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know where I was going to go. So the last two years were, were, were really um, a hodgepodge. And it was a hodgepodge because I didn't really know what I was going to do. I didn't know where I was going to go. I knew that we didn't have money. For me to go to medical school. So um, I just sort of winged it. And by the way, every summer, every summer when I when I first started college in 1954, every summer I would go to the Pocono Mountains and wait on tables. And there were always a lot of kids there who were waiters, busboys, from all the different colleges throughout the East Coast, and mostly in Pennsylvania. And so that was where I would spend uh, literally every summer. I was making 36 bucks. Are you ready for this? 36 bucks a month, free room and board, okay? However, I was making two, $300 a week waiting on tables. And that's in 1954. That was in 1954, 55, 56, and 57. Wow. So that's where I would go. And, and we, I would go to the same place. Everybody knew us. And there were a, a, a lot of my friends from King's College, who I was going to school with, were also working in the same place. And there were a lot of kids from the, the different colleges that were working in other resorts up in the Poconos. The Poconos were a big magnet for young people, especially young married people, to come in as a resort during the summer months. So, so when I was waiting on tables, I had maybe four or five different tables of the same guests every week and for maybe even for two weeks. So tips were very good. And, and um, I would come home the day before I started college. I came home... Uh, Bought some clothes, let mom know what I was doing, came home and started right back into college. So uh, at the end of my junior year, that was my third year of college, I began thinking about uh, med school, pre-med, emphasizing the pre I had plenty of credits. and In fact, I, I could have gone into the missionary work with all the theology credits I had. And... Um, so a couple of my mentors, my teachers, a couple of uh, Notre Dame priests thought I should apply to medical school because they knew I had a hankering to go to medical school. My grades were very good. And um, I had a great curriculum to show anybody. And so um, I had three interviews on the East Coast and one up in Buffalo. Um, and all those, in, the one at Pennsylvania wanted to know who was sponsoring me, another Penn graduate. I had no idea who that was. I had no idea who was a Penn graduate in the whole area. 
And uh, the other schools, uh, Seton Hall had me on a on the uh, alternate program, and Buffalo had me on the alternate program. Um, Boston University had me didn't knew that I didn't have any tuition money, and so that was just we'll let you know. And I was very discouraged, but I was I, I was encouraged by what they told me up in Buffalo. I thought perhaps. If one of the students couldn't make it or there was a spot that became available, I, would, I was encouraged to hang in there. And in the meantime, I had a fellowship at Duquesne out in Pittsburgh for biochemistry. Okay? So that was kind of an aside. I wasn't, I wasn't terribly excited about that, but it was sort of a default if, right. if I couldn't go anywhere. So... Um, the year came and went, and I still didn't know where I was going. The next year, my senior year, um, I had another fellowship uh, application that, that looked pretty good. And um, that was at a school in Ohio. Uh, I'm trying to think, it was at Wesley. Uh, but anyhow, um, I was sort of winging it. And so in my late, it was actually in, in early May, and I had gone up to the Pocono Mountains. And um, prior to that, I had a, a, yeah, it was early May. I had an interview out at Loyola in Chicago. I had never been out of Pennsylvania before other than Philadelphia. So I flew out to Chicago by myself, stayed in a little hotel there, and had my interview um, at Loyola University, and then spent a little bit of time. They took me down to the medical center, which was kind of not very impressive. It was in in the medical complex right there on the near north, uh, the near west side of Chicago, which which was you know St. Luke's Hospital, the University of Illinois, the University of Illinois Medical School the Psychiatric Institute of Illinois. They were all there. It was pretty exciting. So I had an interview there too, and they were very nice. And um, I told them I would expect that I would have to borrow the money for my tuition. Everybody asks you about your tuition. How are you going to pay for your tuition? Is there a, and I would lean on my big brother, who, who was a pharmacist. So uh, I flew back home. I didn't know what to think. I, I just had no idea. As far as... The future looked like in September uh, of uh, 1978, I would be going up to Pittsburgh to Duquesne. But I, I had made no plans or anything like that, and I wasn't terribly excited about it. And then two weeks later, I got this call from Loyola telling me that I had been accepted into the school, into the 1958 starting class and that there were two ladies' organizations in downtown Chicago that were going to pay for my two years of tuition and my, um, my uh, Phi Chi fraternity dues where I stay at the Phi Chi house right there on Ashland Avenue, right in the medical center. Because Loyola's medical school, the old medical school, was right there in the middle of the medical complex. So... so I studied with the guys. I used to study with the guys from Illinois, and our fraternity house was on Ashland Boulevard, which was the fraternity houses for the University of Illinois as well. So there was a lot of spillover to the parties and, and studying with the two schools. And so uh, I spent four years there, and great, great group of colleagues, wonderful group of people who we still stay in touch with. There were two fraternities. There was Phi Chi and Phi, Phi Beta, which was way up on the north side by Loyola University. Phi Chi was right there at the medical complex. You know, you walk to school every day right. through the through the yards. And uh, but, but there was very, very close-knit class. Lots of Notre Dame graduates, lots of John Carroll graduates, lots of Xavier graduates. Uh, uh, there were, it was a class of 77, and I would say about 50 or 60% were 
guys, there were two girls in the class, graduated from um, Catholic schools. And in fact, Roseanne Vitulo, she graduated from a Catholic school in Iowa. She was one of the two girls. The other girl was Norma, who was uh, uh, Japanese, and she, she was good. So the bonding at the school was wonderful and the fraternity house because um, the one-upsmanship philosophy and culture that was so withstanding in the East Coast was gone. It was, it was just nobody really cared. And after two years, when they decided that there were four of us that would qualify for the Honor Society, medical school, I said, nobody cared. Nobody cared. And, and, and nobody went with it. There was one guy. Um, uh, what was his name? God. Jewish kid from, from Detroit. Good guy. And, and um, when he heard the other three of us weren't, weren't interested and didn't, <laughs> we didn't even apply for the honor society. But we played, we played softball. In, in the medical league, um, we had a little basketball team, which was a disaster. But but it it was really kind of a fun time. But everybody worked hard and everybody studied hard and everybody shared their notes with their. There, there was none of this. It was a it was a significant difference from the East Coast mentality, where you know one upsmanship and striving to be the best was always right there. And and this group didn't have any of that and it made me and everybody feel at home so we lost during a period of four years we lost 15 guys actually during a period of first three years but we all um supported one another and um then came the time where we had to apply for an internship where we were going to go for an internship and there was a hospital in, in Youngstown, Ohio, called St. Elizabeth's that everybody was hot on because we had about a half a dozen, maybe eight guys from Ohio. And they were just hot about going to the Cleveland Clinic and going to St. Elizabeth's. And, and um, so, but, but the, um, the first choice of everybody in the medical schools, there were five medical schools in the city at that time. And many of your rotations when you were a student were through different hospitals, like Mercy Hospital on the south side, where I spent a good piece of my second year and a little bit of my third year in pathology. And then you had your rotations through the big county hospital, which was 3,000 beds. And that was next to the medical school. That was across the street from the medical school, Cook County. Cook County Hospital at that time was like 3,300 bits. They took 152 interns a year. Huge hospital. But it was close to, to the fraternity house, close to the medical school, and um, a lot of people who had their rotations through the county hospital recognized that, you know, this was a panoply of, of everything you ever wanted to see. You know, you're in medical school learning all this crap from the books and taking these little rotations through the different hospitals for a month at a time. At county, you saw everything. Right. You, saw, you saw all the trauma. You saw all the junkies. Um, and, and if you took ob gyne, you you were delivering babies all night long and you were off for the next 12 hours and somebody else would come in and take your place. But it was a very exciting place, and that's why uh, a lot of folks, a lot of st the, the, the medical students upon graduation wanted to go to county. And, you know, after a year at county, I thought I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon because it was so exciting to, to be in surgery and doing all this crap. And um, there's one little thing, though, that I have to go back and... and uh, tell you about that in the middle of my third year in the middle of my junior year uh, because my romance with my wife was on hold um, when I came home the summer between 
second and third year, we decided that we were going to get married around Christmas time when I was home. It was going to be a small uh, celebration. And when I came home at Christmas, I had a little blue Volkswagen that, that Brother John bought for me when I came back that summer, summer between second and third year. Uh, I went home, first drove to, to uh, Baltimore to drop off Wally Miller, who was one of my classmates, and I headed north and went back up north. Wally was with me on my trip uh, home through, through Indiana and Ohio. And uh, so Jenny and I got married on December 30th, 1960 small ceremony ironically enough we went to the Poconos for a three-day um, honeymoon and then we packed the car the little Volkswagen drove back to Chicago oh, wow. so uh, this was in the middle of my third year and I remember when we got and we had an apartment on the third floor um, on the on the west side, a little bit north of the Congress Expressway, but we had a nice little apartment there. And um, upon graduation, my mother came out for graduation, and my sisters and brother. And uh, upon graduation, um, there was no orientation at Cook County because everybody knew. Everybody was over there. Everybody had rotations there. So we all, you started work. Right. And you went to work with white pants, white shirt, and white shoes. And they didn't have to be clean, but this was the, the dress code. There was no dress code. And, and so um, at that time, I mentioned that I was interested in orthopedic surgery early, and then I got more interested in sort of the the um, the cognitive areas, the internal medicine, um, neurology, turned me on. And um, there was a a mentor of ours who was on a staff at Loyola, but was also on a staff at Cook County came to me, and along with another guy, uh, Tim Sullivan, who was from New York State, he was a Notre Dame graduate, and asked if we would be interested in going up to the Mayo Clinic for an interview. This was in October of 1962. Yeah. And so we had no idea where the hell a Mayo Clinic was. And we were working every day, so we took, we told the provost who was at the hospital, we were going to take two days off. Don't worry about it, we'll cover you. So Sully and I got in a little blue Volkswagen when we drove up to Rochester, Minnesota. Mm. And, and again, um, we had no idea where the hell that was. We, we, uh, we drove by Madison. <laughs> we didn't know anything about Madison, Wisconsin. And so we got up there and we had our interviews. And when we got back, Uncle Sam was waiting at the door for both of us, uh -huh. Sully and I. So uh, I worked in the summer at a private hospital after I finished my internship in June of 1963. And then for the next... July and August, a little part of September, I worked in a private hospital um, and sent uh, Ginny home because she had had a baby. She had had David at, at uh, St. Joe's Hospital. And um, I was there alone waiting for my orders to come from, from the military, and I wanted to go in the Navy. So the orders came, and then I went down to Philadelphia and had my examination and got my orders, and here you go, pal. Doc, you're assigned to um, 
Cherry Point, North Carolina. And I said, where the hell is Cherry Point, North Carolina? Retracting a little bit. I'm going to go back and um, when I finished high school in 54 and started college in 54 at King's, there were a lot of guys coming out of King's at that time was all male. It was not co-ed. There were a lot of guys coming out of the Korean War. North Korea had invaded South Korea. Um, Eisenhower sent troops into South Korea to stem that assault on South Korea. And that's why we have been very, very much vested in bond to Korea, South Korea, through all these decades. And um, we pushed the North Koreans out and the 38th parallel became the line between North and South Korea and remains the line to this day. So a lot of the guys getting out of the Korean War were in college with me during from 54 to 58. And that was at the time that, that Eisenhower was, uh, was president. And then uh, when I started medical school, um, when I was in medical school uh, in 58, Eisenhower went out in 59 and uh, John F. Kennedy became the president in 1960. Right. And, and um, at that time, there was a real crisis that occurred in the Caribbean. Cuba was a communist country and Russia had its sights set on Cuba. And you got to keep in mind that the Cold War, which was a, a standoff between Russia and United States from the late 1940s, right after the Second World War, on infinitum. Mm -hmm. it, just, it, it, it just kept going until there was a treaty uh, um, uh, that, that banned nuclear testing. That was in the 60s. So, so what happened was that... Um, because Cuba was a communist country and, Cuba, and, and Russia was a communist country, there was sort of a, um, a pseudo relationship between those two countries and Russia saw an opportunity to get into the Western Hemisphere, mm -hmm. which they had really no business trying to do. So when John Kennedy was president in the, in the early 1960s, I, I was in medical school at the time. I was in uh, my first couple of years of medical school, and and um, the Russians, first of all, he he uh, he sent some troops, most of whom were Caribbean uh, or uh, Cuban uh, people who wanted a democracy and were against the communist government. He sent troops in along with some American advisors to try and and upset the communist government. And that was a big failure called the Bay of Pigs. Terrible situation. Uh, they got their butt kicked. And then the Cuban Missile Conf uh, uh, situation <clears throat> <clears throat> arose right after that when Russia was sending missiles to Cuba. And Kennedy put his foot down and US government stepped in and turned those ships away with some very, very stern words, because that would have been the start of another war, for sure. Because Russia had some ideas, put missiles in Cuba, which was 50 miles away from the Florida coast, of course. So, so that didn't happen. And then, of course, um, and again, a lot of things happened when, when I was um, in those 60s, during those, those formal years, and let me get a few little hints here. Um, in the 50s, um, so, so in 1960, 63, I believe, uh, JFK was assassinated, okay? And it was at that time that the atomic band, test ban, came into motion. And, and it was at that time that Russia built the Berlin Wall, separating Germany. And again, this all stems back from the sour grapes that Russia had after World War II. 
1945, it, everything in Europe was being carved up. And Russia was on the short end of the stick, and they never let us forget that. Um, we had all the German scientists coming. They wanted to come to America, not to Russia. So Russia put up this, this, um, this wall that separated East Germany from West Germany. And, and it wasn't until Ronald Reagan in the 80s that uh, um, that wall was torn down by Gorbachev, or was it Brezhnev, one of the Russian leaders at the time, Russian prime ministers. And so um, I wanted to tell you, too, that um, in the, in the mid-1950s, Russia put up Sputnik, which was the first space attempt. Mm -hmm. And it was just a little capsule that went into outer space and swamped down into the uh, the water and it was very successful but it put the Americans on guard and it really fueled our ambition to explore outer space and that's when NASA was developed and John Kennedy was the one that said we got to do this and it all happened after that in the 60s but um Going back, because a lot happened when I was in medical school. Um, it was, it was um, I graduated in 1962. And, and um, in 1962, um, um, actually it was in, in 1963, uh, a lot was happening in the country and... Um, the Vietnam War was going on, and 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 um, we won't get into the late '60s just yet. But but in the early '60s, when I was um, when I was just starting um, in the military, the um, the Beatles arrived in 1964. That was a big deal, and uh, John F. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963. Um, uh, president Johnson then became president for the rest of that John F. Kennedy's term because Johnson was vice president. And then, and then um, Johnson was reelected. He became in for four more years. And um, at that time, uh, things were really heating up in the Vietnam War. And... Um, I was, I was at that time at the Mayo Clinic in my first few years at the Mayo Clinic. This was in 1965, 64. Um, I was in the military and, and from 1963 to 1965. And they had saved or put this residency on hold for me because when I came back from the Mayo Clinic in 1963 um, that's when I when I, when we got back to Chicago there was the the uh, the draft notice okay so so I went in to the military but I didn't know what was going on with my fellowship at the Mayo Clinic which I had just gone up and had my interviews and they said don't worry about it we're going to put that on hold when you get out of the military you can start your residency well a lot of things happened during that period of time when i was in the military in fact there was the the, the, the vietnam war was just going crazy it was being fueled and and a lot of guys were being drafted into the military and it was a lot of physicians who were on the berry plan the Berry Plan was when you were in medical school and during your internship, they couldn't draft you. But as soon as you got out of your internship, you were fair game. So here I am. I wasn't on the Berry Plan, but I was drafted. So, so and, and that was in 1963. So then I didn't know what was going to happen. So in 1965, uh, I got out of the military a little early just before the big offensive in Vietnam and my squadron 
at Cherry Point was going over to Nam. Okay, so this is in in 1965, late 1965, early 1966, and and um, I had notification that my fellowship program was still there. So they flew me up. I was still in the military. They flew me up in the back seat of a jet trainer and to Rochester, Minnesota, and I got out with my orange jumpsuit on and changed my clothes and had one of my friends who was also was already a fellow there, a fellow from Ashley, Pennsylvania. Yeah, he was a urology resident there, Jimmy Henry. He picked me up, brought me in. We stayed there, little hotel, and um, Sully didn't. Sully did not pick up on that fellowship, Sullivan, the guy I originally went up with for, for an interview. So, so, um, I, um, I get in there and sure enough, everything was, was there and, uh, asked me when I could start. And in the meantime, Jenny was, was home, um, having Jim, having Jim, or Mary Rose, either one of those two, Jim and Mary Rose. Jim was a little older than Mary Rose, and I think it was, um, I think it was Mary Rose. So I left Mary Rose home. Yeah, she had Jim when we were in the military. She had Dave when I was an intern. She had Jim when I was in the military in North Carolina. And then she had Mary Rose in Pennsylvania when she was home with her mother. I just let her stay there until... I had everything all taken care of up in Rochester, Minnesota. So I had to get an apartment or I get a house to live in. I had to get started with my fellowship program. I had to buy some certain things to put in the house, the little house. So uh, Jenny came um, in late September. Mary Rose was born, I don't know, she was born in, uh, I think, the 12th. Wasn't it? Isn't that her birthday mm -hmm. of September? Yeah, so so then um, she came in October. She came in early October with the with the baby. Mary Rose was just a month old. And and then um, things sort of settled down, but things were not going in the right direction in in Vietnam. So um, I started my fellowship, and it was in internal medicine. And it was good. It was a very, very serene environment. They were, the Mayo Clinic was the largest graduate school of medicine in the world. And there were people there from all over. There were a lot of Brits there and a lot of Europeans. Not a lot of Asians, interestingly enough. But anyhow, it was a very good experience learning-wise. It was so different than being in the military and being at Cook County because... You had to wear a jacket and you had to wear a tie to work. I mean, um, so then um, things went along pretty well for those three years. And um, I wanted to take some extra time in hematology. So uh, they granted me um, the extra year in hematology. And then I began thinking, well, where are we going to go? Neither one of us really wanted to go back to Pennsylvania. Neither, and we, we, were, we were very happy with the upper Midwest. We were happy with the culture. We were happy with the people. And, and we just didn't want to go back to the valley. The valley was sort of, um, time had passed it by. And the economy never recovered from way back in the 50s and 60s when coal went down the tubes. And so um, I had a good friend down in Kansas City who wanted me to come down there, so I went down for an interview, and uh, it was a nice place. And people were very nice there. I was looking for an academic position, and he was looking for faculty people and people who had a little academic bent. But... I went down there. It was very nice. I mean, it's Kansas City, Missouri, where the medical center was. But it was no place for a liberal Democrat, I can tell you. I mean, it, it became quite apparent that uh, uh, this was Christian Bible country. And I um, 
I wasn't subscribing to that, despite my, my deep theology background. And so then I had another call from Indiana and long discussions. In the, the medical school was in Indianapolis, and I was going to go there for the first... Uh, I was going to be there for two to three years, and then they would decide whether or not I would be a, a staff person, a full-fledged staff person. And I, you know, being from the Mayo Clinic, I thought um, it just didn't sit well. People from, after you finish the Mayo Clinic, you're, you know, you're up here. You know, people don't say, well, we'll evaluate you after two or three years. I mean, that's bull crap, quite frankly. I mean, and when you come from an institution like that, people should know you had a good quality education and experience. So um, then we came over in the middle of December 1969 to Marshfield Clinic because there were, at that time, there were 110 docs here and they had six guys from the Mayo Clinic, six Mayo alumni. So these two guys were, were really uh, courting me pretty hard. Um, I, I, they knew me because I was on the softball team over at Mayo and I, was, I played softball over there for three years and these guys... Um, knew that I was finishing in hematology and I was looking around and they came over and, and visited and came, took Jeannie and I out for dinner and so forth. And it was a nice, uh, friendly relationship. And they would come over periodically and, and talk to us. So finally, in December of 69, Jeannie and I drove to Marshville. I had no idea where the hell Marshville was. And when we got here, it was in the middle of December, late December. We stayed in a little motel down there by the where the swimming pool is. And there was snow piled up in the middle of Central Avenue. And it was cold and snowy. And I, I thought, geez, you know, this is really the tundra. And um, so then I had my interviews there, and the people were just extremely nice. They, they were just, everything was just wide open. There was no formalities. And I told him that I had two research projects that I was involved in that I really wanted to keep the collaboration with my colleagues over in Mayo. I said, take as much time as you want. Well, um, despite the collegiality and the friendship and the parties that we had, um, we came over two more times in the winter and I, I, I still wasn't sure that this was all real. I mean, it was a very socialistic kind of environment. You know, no, nobody talked money. Nobody talked time away. And it was just a comfortable... And each time I came back here for, for you know, investigating a little deeper, it was always the same. It was very collegial. And, and, um, and again, the informal environment. You, you felt like you were here for a long time. So... Um, At the end of my third visit here, which was in um, March, late March, um, I got a call from the president of the clinic. I, I forgot to tell you that at the Mayo Clinic, as a fellow at the world-famous Mayo Clinic, I was being paid $300 a month, 300 bucks a month. But I had a little bit of help from the government because... I had been in the military, okay? So I was getting an extra $200 a month. But at that time, we had four kids. Right. Tom was born in Rochester. We never held that against him. <laughs> um, and, and so um, I got this call from the president of the clinic, Dr. My uh, uh, Russell Myers. Um, and uh, Russell Lewis, and um, he told me that they were, were going to advance me eight hundred dollars a month until I finished my my fellowship, and you know I I just thought I died and went to heaven, and I said, well, suppose I don't come. I didn't I didn't I hadn't signed any contract, or made any kind of formal ties. I said, well, what if I decide not to come? He said, you can 
pay me back when you get a real job. And and I hadn't decided where I was going to go at that time. I you know Fargo was recruiting me too. Fargo, North Dakota had a big clinic. And um, we knew we weren't going up to Fargo. And then um, I said, well, what what if I decide to come? What's the interest? He said, it's a wash. So I came over here for a fourth visit. And again, it was it was so easy and comfortable. I, I really felt like I was part of the group. So on the way home, we decided we were going to come. And about 15 minutes later, I got a speeding ticket in western, <laughs> western Wisconsin on the way out of here. And uh, so in July, I was all done at the Mayo Clinic. And um, the people here were unbelievable in the sense that, and you gotta, you got to get the picture, this is in 1969 and 70, 70, we decided to come. And it was at that time that John Glenn and whoever else it was walked on the moon. That was in July of 69. And, and again, um, at that time, everybody was marching against the Vietnam War. There were protests all over the place in all the universities and colleges throughout the country, and including the University of Wisconsin, where I was going to get a faculty position. So when we decided we were going to come here, the real estate people were looking for houses for me. And they had already picked out a house on the corner of Fifth and Lincoln. I don't know, you guys were not in the, in the uh, scheme of things at that time. And, and, and Mike Hughes was the real estate guy, and it was like Mike was my, my cousin, my first cousin. It was, he was doing everything, all these things, lining things. I said, well, yeah, I don't have the money for a down payment. He said, you don't need a down payment. And I said, I don't need a down payment f for a $33,000 house? He said, no. He said, you're with the clinic. Don't worry about it. Just decide when you want to get some stuff over here. Oh, jeez. So, so in late June and, and early July, we came over and took possession of the house. Mike had arranged everything for us, literally everything. And um, we, um, I started, I got a faculty, a, a, a staff appointment in 1960 despite the fact that I signed my contract in, in 1969. And I'm sorry, I got a contract to start in 1970, I, despite I, I signed my contract in 69. And um, things fell into place very quickly. I was happy with my being able to do some clinical research in the early 70s when I came over here and I stayed in touch with the people in Rochester. And then when I came here, uh, I was interested in teaching and in research. And um, we had students, medical students, come from a lot of different schools. And we had even the residents from the University of Wisconsin coming up and spending three months at, at the St. Joseph's Hospital in, in the clinic, in the Marshall Clinic. And at that time, I remember, there was 110 docs here. But every, that we didn't have any, any um, family practitioners. Everybody was a specialist. And I was brought in as a hematologist. And um, so the, the, the staff was, as I said, it was like a, it was very egalitarian. And it was like a socialist environment because there were no, there was no seniority, there was no escalating salaries. Um, and so um, I said, why do we have all these students here and we have the residents coming from different residency training programs, why don't we have our own programs here? And they said, well, you know, you gotta talk to the higher levels, the, 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 the president. So I did talk to the president and that was in 1973, 74, and he said, well, send your application in. Send the application for the, for the institution in. 
we sent it in and it got approved and we selected our first residence in 1975. Four guys. And um, that was in internal medicine. And then pediatrics and general surgery programs fell right into place. And, you know, just like a domino effect. And, and everything, and, and in the 1980s, the staff proliferated remarkably because there was a commitment to education and research. So, so going back into the 60s when I was a fellow here, um, uh, Robert Kennedy was shot in 1963, I think. No, no, um, that was John Kennedy. Yeah, John Kennedy. Um, Robert Kennedy um, was, was um, shot the same year that, that Martin Luther was shot. RFK was shot uh, in 1968. 1968, when I, was, when I was finishing. I remember this quite well because uh, I was at the Mayo Clinic and I was leaving the clinic to go over to Methodist Hospital. And I got the word from one of my mentors who was crossing the street with me that that um, Martin Luther King was shot in 1968 and Bobby Kennedy was shot. And it was at that time in 1968 that there was another big spike in the Vietnam activity. And it was in 1968 that the universities and the young people were going crazy. There was a big mass movement for these kids to go to Canada because they didn't want to get drafted. They didn't want to go to the war. There were anti-war uh, protests all over the country. These were difficult times. And when I went down to, in 1970, to register as a staff person because there was a strong affiliation between Marshville and the University of Wisconsin, to register as a, as a clinical professor at, at um, University of um, Wisconsin, there was a lot of uh, people there on edge because of the protests. And in fact, I think it was in 1970, and you might correct me on this, the Armstrong brothers blew up the physics building in the early mornings mm -hmm. as, a, as, as a push toward the anti-war demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Two brothers. In the early mornings, that bomb went off and killed a young man who was in there studying. So I was down there shortly after that just to let them know that um, I was looking for a staff appointment and I was looking for later a faculty appointment because I was, I was going to be teaching the, the second and third year medical students at the University of Wisconsin where I would go periodically and teach. And, and uh, those were scary years, I can tell you. Uh, and, and you could feel it. You could feel the environment when you walked around the campus that, that um, things were not quite right. And, and, and again, this was, the Tet Offensive was in 67 and 68. And then that's when the United States escalated their involvement and wanted to draft more people. And this is when it all happened. So I was, I was really lucky to get out of the military in 65, late 65, because things were going this way. And, and when I got out, I got out two months early to pick up my fellowship up in, at Mayo. And it was right after that, when I got in, uh, the Vietnam War was was really in full swing. And then, as I said, in, in, in 68 and 69, they had the Tet Offensive. And, and geez, uh, I don't know what was going to happen, but I knew that I was not in the reserves. I made damn sure that I, I was not a re, in, in a member of the reserves, the Naval Reserves. And, and there were a lot of fellows at the Mayo Clinic who were in the same boat that I was, getting out of the Vietnam War and coming, starting their fellowship at Mayo. And that was in 68, 69. I, you've answered most of my questions, but I, I do want to... Well, I can elaborate on whatever. Yeah, but uh, the, one of the last things I want to 
I hope you can elaborate on is the, like, during the civil rights movement and desegregation uh, during the 50s and 60s, and, like, kind of what you saw or what was going on during the time. The civil rights movement was terrible. I mean, it was very apparent that the black population in the southern states, mainly, were, were just taking a backseat to everything, especially schools, social environment, um, all sorts of things that were, that were uh, very, very biased toward the white population. And, and this was very, very difficult to break that social environment down the South. And as I mentioned to you earlier, in 1957 was the first time in Little Rock, Arkansas, that this thing came to a head and desegregation was looked at in reality. No one knew if this thing was just a, a bump in the road or if it was going to work, but in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, the country had a bird's eye view as to how big a problem this was. And then after that, the big universities um, in the schools down south recognized and realized that they had an obligation to desegregate and offer uh, education to these young black people coming out of high school. But in addition, they also recognized at the value of the athletic prowess of these kids. And um, the rest is history. Most of these big universities and schools in the South now, their athletic teams, whether they be male or female, are predominantly uh, people of color. And what does this have to do with the school? It provides a tremendous amount of income for these activities, these sports. And not only that, the opportunity soon became apparent that if you brought these uh, color of people into the proper, unbiased educational system, they were really become very, very good citizens of this country. And as I said, the rest is history. So it wasn't as big a problem uh, up north, but it was a lingering problem up north. There's, there's no question about it. But in the south, it was, it was a terrible, terrible stain on the people, the social structure, the educational systems in the south. And, and, and really, this didn't start a change un, until, you know, uh, the early 60s and the mid-60s. And Martin Luther King got shot at the height of the civil rights movement. And that was, what, in 68, 1968. And, and uh, things quickly escalated. And the country finally realized what a major problem segregation was. And they also recognized the percentage of, of colored people who made up in the demographics of the country, especially in the South. So again, the rest is history. What else you got? Um, that's kind of all I've got. You, you answered. I can't believe it. <laughs> you, um, you hit all the points. I, if, if you want to, if there's anything else you remember or if you want to. I, I told you about, about McDonald's tonight, 1955. That was a big uh, deal. Extend on that big bit. deal. <laughs> it was, it was the it was the first fast food restaurant that had exploited the idea of fast foods, and and it caught on like wildfire all over the country. It first started in the Midwest, in the Chicago area. I think that was where the first McDonald's yeah. was. And and it didn't take long. People just latched on to that whole idea of fast foods. And let me see, I am, um, we talked about Eisenhower and I mentioned to you earlier that Eisenhower was responsible for the design and development and financing 
of the U.S. interstate system. That was his baby. Mm -hmm. That was big. Yeah. Um, and then I mentioned to you Sputnik was in 1957, about that same time. And um, the same time as, as uh, the Little Rock, Arkansas desegregation movement. And um, again, um, at that time I was, um, I was just starting, um, in 1958 I was starting medical school in Chicago. And, and the first, first three years of medical school, I was um, sort of completely isolated. I mean, I, I, I didn't know what was going on because my whole agenda was to study. That's all we did. We had a party now and then at the fraternity house. That was part of social life. And we had, we had a, a softball team too. Um, but, but nobody was paying attention to what was going on in the country, um, at that time, the Vietnam thing was just smoldering, and the U.S. was pushing more and more resources into Vietnam. Um, and and no one knew where this was going to end up, but it soon escalated into a major conflict, and it, it affected uh, because the the draft soon became quite apparent. And the young people, the young males in the country recognized and realized that life was going to be interrupted. Mm -hmm. And that's led to all the protests. Uh, what else you got? Kind of, that is, you hit pretty much every question. Yeah. Right? Is there any just words of wisdom you want to? Talk about like, <laughs> like what, what from your yeah I, I think I think what's changed is um, there are many many things that that impact on how things changed in this country the social environment the education levels the technology levels um but one of the things that you have to put into the equation is that in 1950, the population of the United States was about 155 million people. It's now 330 million. And with that growth comes a lot of problems. And also during the last 25, 30 years, there's been a tremendous, not slow, but steady infiltration or immigration into this country from all over the world, all over the world. On the West Coast side, the Asian countries. On the Southeast side, from the Caribbean countries. And on the East Coast, a lot of the European people come in. Now, what drives them to come in and immigrate into the, our country is a mixed bag. But primarily, the opportunities, the opportunities for business, technology, and number one, higher levels of education. You know, you talk about all these Japanese and Chinese coming here, but gee, we always think of them as being uh, the technocrats, the, the gurus of high technology. Well, baloney, they all come to the United States to get their, 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 their graduate degrees. Some of them go back home, but most of them stay here. And the other large group that I can attest to that I have seen escalate in the past 30 years since I've been here in Marshville as a physician is the influx of professional people like physicians into our country. And a large segment of those professional people, namely physicians, come from India. And India is the second most populated country in the world. India has 1.3 billion, with a B, 
people. China has 1.4. Together, those two countries make up 40%, 41% of the population of the world, at least from what we know that's registered. You know, there are a lot of countries that don't have registration. And so India, I have a lot of good colleagues here that are Indians. They pride themselves as being the largest democratic country in the world. Well, if you look at India, it is anything but a democratic country. They have a caste system. They have those that can and those that will never. And that's the way things are. They, have, they can't feed their people. They can't educate their people. And my wife spent six weeks or eight weeks over there, and she can attest to the abject poverty over there and the crowded cities over there and the lack of, of uh, equity over there. And so when these people come here, the well-educated people come here, they're fairly well off financially as well. But they come here as professionals. They don't want to go back home. And I always, not always, but I know some of my colleagues very well. And I say, you know, especially these young guys that come in through our training program, why, why don't you guys want to go back home and teach? I mean, don't you feel obligated to go back and get into medical schools over there and teach these young people? No way. There's just no way they're going to go back home. And that's the same story with most of the immigrants. And you can go right down the line, the Chinese, the Japanese. They don't want to have anything to do with it. And so the population here has doubled in just uh, 70 years. The population of the globe, world population, has tripled since 1950. Tripled. So, get into infectious disease like we're experiencing this past year. Technology, population, transportation. It's a recipe for disaster. Crowded situations, the ease with which you can fly from one continent to another. Infections that are coming out of the wildlife, and com coming out of areas that we never dreamed of. And these infectious disease agents, there are so many of them in the pipeline that we never even heard of. I mean, look what's happened just recently. Zika, Ebola, you know. Uh, and, and here we have the coronavirus. I mean... There's thousands of these agents that are in the pipeline that we don't even know about. Mm -hmm. Some of them are in the other animals, some of the primates. And the closer we get to them and the more we keep stealing their habitat, the chances of us contracting these infectious disease agents going from one species to another is obvious. What else you got? That is it, but... Boy, I went off key there with the infections <laughs> and things. Well, I mean, you just kind of uh, reinstated that, like, education and how, how from the... Education. It's, and... it's just, uh, you know... Yeah. It's, and it's and right now, the country has become so partisanized. Mm -hmm. It's split right down the middle. And if you look really carefully at the agenda of the vast makeup of these two populations, you will see a remarkable disparity in the education levels. There is no question about it. And, and our, our, uh, one of our congresswomen, uh, she didn't even know that Guam was a territory of the United States. And our president, our president, didn't know that Puerto Rico was one of our territories as well. And when he did find out, he wanted to trade Puerto Rico for Greenland, you know, with, 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 the, with, the, uh, with the Danes. I mean, 
you know, when you have people like this that are leading the country and you, you sit back and say, what the hell happened? I mean, who are these people? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I don't have a long number of years to go, but people like you and your kids will have to be facing all these transitions. Right. And I'm not going to say they're good or bad, but I'll tell you they're going to be different. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Massa, for... Oh, doing cut the story. bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I do really greatly appreciate it. Thank you for taking time out of your day. You're welcome. You know that.